So the theme of today's episode is freedom, whether we are free, if not, why not, and whether we want to be free. And the two authors I'm going to discuss are Gorgias and Dostoevsky. Uh, Dostoevsky is a name you've probably heard, 19th century Russian author, but Gorgias is a name you probably haven't heard. Uh, Gorgias is another of the sophists. In the last episode, I discussed Critias, um, who uh, is a contemporary, and, and once again, we're talking about the 5th century BC in, in Athens, or at least the Greek world. And these sophists, just as a quick reminder, are professional orators. They know how to make persuasive speeches, and they know how to teach other people how to make persuasive speeches. And that's an especially important, that's an important skill at any time, but that's an especially important skill in democratic Athens, because every decision made by the city was made, uh, formally at any rate, by every citizen. They didn't have representatives who would go to Washington and, and do the dirty work of government for them. Rather, decisions were made by the assembled Athenian citizenry. Not everybody would come uh, for every decision, obviously, but the important ones, like whether to go to war or not, uh, were made by most of the citizens. And if you want a large crowd to to do something, uh, it helps to know how to persuade large crowds with speech. And these sophists then were uh, powerful people, because if they could teach anyone to do that, they could charge a lot of money uh, to, for that teaching. And so they traveled the Greek world, went from town to town, city to city, had a lot of sway in a place like Athens that was very wealthy, uh, or at least there, there were many uh, wealthy people in, in that city, uh, young men of established families uh, in Athens who were looking for that kind of education. And so when Gorgias or another sophist like Protagoras arrived in town, it would be like the arrival of a, of a rock star. People would uh, flock to this person. And uh, one of the attractions was that the sophist would give a demonstration speech, uh, in Greek an epideictic speech, a demonstration of his skill. It would be like an advertisement nowadays. And before mass media, the only way to advertise uh, would be to show the audience exactly what it is you do. So the speech of Gorgias that I want to discuss in this episode is called The Encomium of Helen. And uh, encomium is a speech in praise of. And so a, a speech in praise of Helen would be to a typical Greek of the 5th century a sort of shocking proposition. Uh, Helen was the eve of the Greeks. She was the face that uh, sailed a thousand ships. They blamed her for the Trojan War. So just to recap the story, if you're not familiar with it, from Greek mythology. She was the wife of Menelaus. She's half divine, so great is her beauty. And a Trojan mission, uh, a mission from the city of Troy, comes to the castle of Menelaus. And among that Trojan mission is Paris, the most handsome son of the king of Troy, Priam. And Paris leaves with Helen uh, in the middle of the night. Uh, he, he rapes her in the old-fashioned sense, takes her away. And whether he raped her in, in our modern sense uh, is another question that we'll, we'll get into in a moment. But he takes her back to Troy. And in the story of the Trojan War that's fought between the Greeks and the Trojans, it's fought over Helen. Menelaus and his brother Agamemnon, through various treaties, uh, compel a huge... Uh, contingent of Greek soldiers and ships to go to Troy and to besiege the city that famously had the biggest walls in, in the Mediterranean world. And in the story, at any rate, the siege takes 10 years and effectively destroys both civilizations. The Greeks win eventually, but uh, are uh, weakened in the story. So uh, misogynistic as the Greeks were, and if you don't know, they were one of the most misogynistic societies that, well, at least that I've ever encountered next to, say, the Taliban. Uh, they blamed it on Helen. And so to come to town and say, as your advertisement, that you're going to give a speech in praise of Helen, this would be shocking. And people would come just to hear it. It would be like somebody coming to Washington to advertise his persuasive skills to members of con Congress and saying, you know, I'm going to give a speech tonight in praise of Osama bin Laden. You think, well, okay, if that speech were allowed to be given, uh, 
uh, people would be drawn to it because, especially if the guy had a, a reputation for being an amazing speaker, you'd think, wow, if he can convince me that Osama bin Laden should be praised, uh, he's got to be a great speaker. And that was the challenge that uh, Gorgia set for himself to try and persuade people uh, in a short speech that Helen uh, was not to blame. And his argument is really quite straightforward in, in, in the abstract. Uh, the argument is that she wasn't responsible. And so, you know, whatever happened was not her fault. And so it's not so much a speech in praise of Helen as a defense of Helen, that she shouldn't be blamed for the Trojan War. She shouldn't be blamed more particularly for going with Paris to Troy. And what he does is considers uh, four possibilities for uh, why she might have gone, or why she did go with him. In other words, each one of them is a possibility that, for why she might have gone with Paris. The say the first that we can dispense with immediately is that she was raped in our sense, namely Paris physically uh, tore her away from her home. And of course, uh, the Greeks are not so misogynistic as to believe that if, well, if she was forced uh, by physical main force, that it was her fault. So if that's one of the possibilities, uh, and, and that in fact happened, then it's not her fault. She's not responsible. So what are the three others? Well, uh, one of them is that she was, uh, by divine uh, will, uh, compelled to go to Troy. And um, he talks about this as fate. Um, fate was an abstract power for the Greeks that was also embodied in stories of the three fates, one of whom would pull the string uh, off the spindle, and this would be the string of someone's life, for example. The other would measure how far to pull it. This would be a, a demarcation of how long you were to live, for example. And the third fate would cut it, uh, determining that you would die at that point. Uh, so the fates were very powerful. In fact, so powerful that in one Greek tragedy, uh, probably by Aeschylus, the Prometheus Bound, Prometheus uh, knows what will happen to Zeus, and Zeus doesn't know. And even if Zeus did know, he wouldn't be able to avoid it. Uh, Prometheus knows that Zeus will be deposed and uh, knows exactly how it will happen. And the, fate is, the fates or fate was so strong in the Greek mind that not even Zeus could overturn the fates. So if the divine force that led Helen to go with Paris to Troy was fate, well, then she's not to be blamed. Gorgias also talks about uh, the gods, and here I think he means not the fate, the fates, those three goddesses, but uh, the Olympian divinities, and particularly Aphrodite. So he speaks about the power of Aphrodite, the power of love. Greek gods were jealous. They expected you to make certain sacrifices to them, and if you didn't make those sacrifices, they would punish you. And Aphrodite had a son, Eros, and who gets popularized through his Latin name even today as Cupid. Cupido in Latin is Eros, sexual passion. Aphrodite is the goddess of beauty. And uh, if you didn't give the right sacrifice to Aphrodite, if you didn't show her enough respect, she would send her malicious son, sexual passion, to ruin your life, or at least to complicate it. And so if... The reason Helen went with Paris to Troy was because uh, somebody, even perhaps Menelaus, hadn't made the right sacrifices uh, to Aphrodite. Well, then surely it's not Helen's fault. Even if she hadn't, she herself hadn't made the right sacrifices. Uh, that's a forgivable offense. Uh, she shouldn't be blamed for the Trojan War because she forgot to make a sacrifice to Aphrodite. So again, she's not responsible. There are two others, uh, other reasons that Gorgias mentions. One is necessity. And in the speech, he talks about uh, atomism, uh, a philosophical theory that uh, was born in Greece in the 5th century, so at this time. It's the theory that the world is made up of atoms and void. And, you know, very influential theory in the early modern period, the, the birth of modern atomism that we still have with us in our uh, elemental understanding of chemistry. 
course, it's become much more sophisticated and has many more experimental warrants and has become qualified in all sorts of ways. But the birth of the idea is in the 5th century. Democritus is the name of the most famous atomist of this era. And Gorgias is not himself an atomist. As I said with Critias, there usually aren't commitments to any particular philosophical view, but they're uh, ingenious at using philosophical views to make their points. And you know, they're making their points not to get at the truth, but in order to have an effect on an audience. And here, remember, the overarching goal is for Gorgias to persuade the audience that Helen is not responsible for going to Troy. Well, if necessity is the force that made her go to Troy, if he's thinking about it atomistically, as Democritus did, there were necessary forces of atoms bumping into other atoms that made the universe unfold according to a predetermined pattern of physical forces. And so if that were the reason why Helen went to Troy, well, again, she shouldn't be blamed. If you know a wind knocks you over, you, you can't be blamed for falling down. It's nobody's fault. If you want to blame somebody, it's the wind, which is to say nobody is to blame. Well, all of life is like that if atomism is true, democracy and atomism. And so if necessity is the reason that Helen went to Troy, well, then she's not to blame. So however you, you count it, so far, we've got a series of reasons, uh, of possibilities why Helen may have gone to Troy. And in each case, the reason um, tells us that it's not her fault. The final one is the most interesting. And Gorgias uses a, a typically uh, sophistic turn of phrase that gets translated to English uh, quite well in the translation that I uh, work with. And uh, he says, either she was by force reduced or by words seduced. So we already talked about force reduced, namely rape. But the final possibility that he considers is by words seduced. So one understanding is that Paris came, let's say, to Helen's chamber in the night, and through his good looks or his sense of humor or his promises of uh, gifts she would be given when she got back to his native Troy, whatever it was, she cha he changed her mind, and she decided to give up her marriage with Menelaus and her home with him and leave with Paris to go back to Troy. And that This is the turning point of the argument because although most in the audience would accept at this point that it wasn't her fault if the reason she went was either force or uh, divine power, whether it be the fates or Aphrodite or by necessity, uh, physical compulsion, while most in the audience would be willing to accept that, if the final possibility is that she went because she was persuaded by words, well, uh, that's her fault, right? She let herself be persuaded by words. She should have known that that was wrong and she should have stayed, you might think. But uh, Gorgias gives an atomistic argument why uh, we shouldn't hold her responsible if she was by words seduced. And again, he's not an atomist, but atomism is an elite uh, intellectual theory uh, by this point in the second half of the fifth century. It's something that would have tremendous prestige rather the way neuroscience gets used nowadays and arguments uh, against all sorts of things and for all sorts of things. And how many people actually understand the neuroscience? Very few of us. But boy, if somebody can point to some neuroscientist who said something, it's really hard to argue with that. So that's the kind of argument Gorgias is using when he appeals to atomism in this context. And his theory is this, or at least his proposal is this. What is, what are words? Uh, what is language? What is speech except the exhalation of breath, which is simply atoms, and they travel across the space between the speaker and the listener, and when they reach the listener, these atoms, they enter into the ear of the listener and set in motion a chain of physical causes, which are, again, necessary, that make the person do what the words, uh, or rather the atoms, have to make them do according to the laws of physics, uh, as we would call it now, and as, as they call it too, uh, material necessity. So, you know, for example, if uh, I hit you with a baseball bat, you get a bruise, and it's not your fault that you get a bruise when I hit you with a baseball bat. Well, if speech is the exhalation of atoms that go into your ear, 
Well, it's a very fine sort of hitting. It's not a brutal hitting like a baseball bat on an arm that causes a bruise, but it's a physical event. The baseball bat is my words, and the um, bruise is the action you do as a result of my words. And you know, in, in, intermediately, whatever goes on in your brain or whatever organ is the one where the atoms go and affect things such that your body starts moving in a different way. So the, the result of this argument is that by force reduced, by words seduced, there's no difference. The seduction by words is a kind of reduction by force. And what's truly amazing uh, about this speech in my mind is that, remember the context, this is Gorgias making an advertisement for his own skill and I'll get you to recall the, the thought, you're a Greek who thinks Helen is guilty, and you sit before this man who gives this speech, and of course you have to read it, and even the English will give you a sense, but uh, it's you know, more impressive obviously in the Greek because like poetry, it's, you know, it's, its particularity gets lost in translation, but you sit before this man who spins this amazing tale with these wonderful world, words that in, enchant your ears, and he makes all sorts of plausible points about how she's not responsible if fate were in charge or necessity or Aphrodite or Eros or physical force and so on. And by the time you get to this point, typically uh, you would be charmed by Gorgias. He, he will have, for many people, obviously, since he made a lot of money doing this and was a star when he came to Athens, a lot of people were charmed by his art. And so when he makes this final point about by words seduced, as if words were a charm, uh, even a physical force that acted with necessity on your ears and your mind, he's already demonstrated the truth of that claim if you're with him at this point, which he expected you to be. And so he's rising above the speech and saying not simply that Helen is innocent, but that she can be shown to be innocent through my words, which are so powerful that I've convinced even you, even you listening, uh, listening to Gorgias. So what does this have to say about freedom? Well, this isn't the last word on uh, free will. Uh, it's a long debate in the history of philosophy that you know, arguably begins here uh, with this text, as far as I know. And uh, it's difficult if you are a materialist that is to say, somebody who thinks that the, the world uh, is essentially material. Uh, atoms and void is one way of putting materialism or physicalism, as it's called. If you think that the world is essentially physical, and uh, nothing but physical, then if there are necessary laws that determine the behavior of physical things, uh, it's very hard to see how there is free will in such a world. Uh, in fact, it's very hard to see how there's speech, properly speaking, <laughs> because it, on the analysis that Gorgias has given, what, is, what makes speech different from swinging a baseball bat? What makes a bruise different from going to Troy? It's all just atoms bumping into atoms. And so Gorgias, uh, ironically, through speech, is showing us that there isn't really a, such a thing as speech if as different from deeds. Speech is a kind of deed. It's all deeds, motions uh, of matter, and, and we're not free. So the Black Mirror episode that I want to use as a touchstone for this point, and, and again, I'll, I'll devote a separate episode to the discussion of, uh, of that Black Mirror episode, but the episode that I find most relevant here is Bandersnatch, the new one uh, that came out in December 2018. And I'm still thinking about this episode myself, and I don't know that I've even seen all the endings. I, I'm speaking right now in January of 2019, so it hasn't even been a month since that episode was out. But uh, just broadly, w without you know saying what I hope to say in a separate episode about that episode, broadly speaking, uh, one of the major themes of that episode is freedom and the character... Uh, feels increasingly that he's determined by uh, something, some force or some people, and it's, uh, it's uh, 
quite marvelous, I think, how Charlie Brooker is able to draw us into that experiment by having us make the choices, uh, sometimes against our own will. Sometimes he leaves us only one choice. Uh, sometimes he gives us choices that are in, phrased in different words, but they amount to the same thing. At any rate, we'll get into all that uh, in a separate episode. But uh, you know, if, if you're looking at the Black Mirror episodes in connection with listening to this podcast's uh, more explicitly philosophical, textual discussions, uh, this that would be the one for this uh, speech of Gorgias. Because if Gorgias is right, it's not just that the character in that episode is determined. It's not just that Helen is determined, but that we're all determined because we're all living in a world of atoms and void. Now, again, Gorgias doesn't believe that, or if he does, it doesn't matter to his purpose. But the ingenuity of his argument is that it doesn't have to be a world of atoms and void. It can also be a world of gods, of fate, of divine forces. But any time we give an explanation of why someone does something, we're putting it as, and that was the cause. And so insofar as that was the cause, that determined that the effect follow. And that is the basic problem of free will and determinism, is that if we're going to explain the world, we have to give causes. And what are causes but things that determine certain effects? So that's one way to think of the consequence of Gorgias' speech. Another way, uh, for our purposes, when we think back about other episodes of this podcast where we talked about Plato's cave or about Critias or even about Foucault, that... What we have here in this speech is a demonstration of the power of speech to manipulate minds. And you, know, you may not have been persuaded by Gorgias. But of course, if you weren't, it wasn't Gorgias's fault. It could have been my uh, account of Gorgias, which didn't attempt to be rhetorical in the way that his speech certainly was. But what he gives us is a demonstration of the art of sophistry that Critias gives us only a small hint of in his discussion of how the leader would, the wise leader would convince a population to believe in uh, a punitive God uh, of whom the population should be fearful. And I'd bring it all back in the end, as I so often do, to Plato's cave, that Gorgias is giving us a, a hint of what puppeteers in that cave would be like, people who could make a world for other people. And by a world, I mean a way that the world seems. A clever speaker like Gorgias could persuade, um, in this particular case, people not to condemn Helen as as the criminal, as the cause of the Trojan War, but could, more importantly, when they see the consequences of that speech, be persuaded that they don't have free will. Um, And that's, I think, a really important uh, way of living one's life, thinking whether one has free will or doesn't. And and perhaps we can make that a subject of a later episode. I suspect we will. But in the meantime, think about Bandersnatch episode, if you're watching that uh, in tandem with these lectures. Think about the freedom of that character, the way in which we, the audience, uh, are or are not controlling him. But more importantly, back to Plato's cave, Strange as that tale is, the Bandersnatch tale or the cave tale, Socrates says, they are like us. Those prisoners are like us. In which case, someone like Gorgias is somebody from whom we would have to free ourselves, somebody who would be convincing us that this is the way it is, uh, that you're determined. Uh, don't question this, for example. And of course, that's one of the you know basic benefits of philosophy is that you don't have to take what's presented as real, as in fact real. You can start asking the question whether this is real or not. And remember, that is the basic deceit of the puppeteers. Not that they convince the prisoners that something is real, but they present images in such a way that for the prisoners it never even occurs to them to ask whether this is real. So much for Gorgias for now. Now it's time to talk about Dostoevsky, uh, who I mentioned at the beginning, uh, 19th century Russian novelist, and um, by universal consent, I think the greatest of his novels is The Brothers Karamazov, the longest of his novels. And uh, in it, there are three, uh, hint perhaps more, brothers. Uh, the oldest is uh, Dmitri or Mitya. Uh, the next is Ivan, and the youngest is Alyosha. 
And Alyosha is uh, a monk at this point, uh, or at least a novitiate in a monastery. And he is talking with his brother Ivan, who is a cynical atheist. And this episode in the Brothers Karamazov is called The Grand Inquisitor, and it's excerpted in many textbooks. It's studied as an example of existentialism, for example. You'll find it in existentialist source books. Uh, But I think it's important to remember that uh, this is taken out of a novel, and uh, its full meaning doesn't stand on its own. It's a story in the novel Brothers Karamazov, told by a certain character, Ivan, to his brother, Alyosha. And it's uh, a way to, in, in the story at any rate, rattle Alyosha's faith. Because it's a story about uh, an inquisitor, the grand inquisitor of the title, uh, of the Catholic Church. Now, Dostoevsky was not a Catholic, uh, a Roman Catholic. He rather was uh, um, a devotee of the Russian Orthodox Church, and he's quite critical of Catholicism. So his critique of Catholicism is not necessarily a critique of Christianity or of um, any particular church, uh, but it's been used that way. So at any rate, let's tell the story. Ivan uh, describes uh, the second coming of Jesus. It's in a Spanish town, I think in the 17th century, and uh, this man, who turns out to be Jesus, uh, is healing the sick and is about to raise a dead child from her recent death. And just as Jesus is about to do so, and the crowd is cheering and uh, in awe of um, this Messiah, an inquisitor uh, walks by and interrupts the... Uh, resurrection, grabs Jesus, has his retinue grab Jesus, and takes Jesus away from the crowd uh, to interrogate him uh, in private. And it's important to the story that the crowd, who has become devoted to Jesus very quickly by seeing the miracles that he's performing, acquiesces immediately to the Inquisitor's decision to remove Jesus from the crowd. You'd think this this miracle worker is about to revive a dead child. You'd think they'd step between the Inquisitor and and Jesus to allow him to finish his work, but they don't. They're so obedient to the Inquisitor, and that's that's important to the Inquisitor's point, that by this point, he argues to Jesus uh, once he gets him alone, by this point, the church has become so powerful in the minds of its subjects uh, here in Spain in the story that Uh, It can even persuade the faithful that having seen Jesus, they have not seen Jesus, even though their own authority depends on uh, the the first coming of Jesus. So why? The Inquisitor says to Jesus, "You, you resisted three temptations of Satan in the desert. And uh, these, each of these temptations he analyzes as uh, thematic uh, for a craving of the human heart, uh, miracle, mystery, and authority. So the first temptation that Satan gives Jesus after his you know, 40 days and 40 nights in the desert is, uh, Jesus, turn these stones to bread. And Jesus famously refuses by saying, man does not live on bread alone. The inquisitor Uh, says to Jesus, what a terrible mistake you made. Don't you realize that by having changed stones to bread, especially in front of an audience, you would have been performing a miracle, and that is what people want. And if you perform uh, miracles for people, they'll do whatever you want of them. So by not turning the stone to bread, you showed that people should follow you not because you do something for them by giving them bread, their most basic necessity, but rather they should follow you freely uh, in faith alone. And so the Inquisitor understands, correctly Dostoevsky thinks, I believe, that uh, Jesus' point was to elicit free faith. And so that's not to elicit, but to offer the opportunity to believe in him freely because he's the true son of God, again, according to Dostoevsky. Whereas the Inquisitor thought that was a mistake because people can't handle freedom. So uh, just one small quotation from this story in the translation that I'm working with. 
He calls it the fearful burden of free choice. This inquisitor, spoken by Ivan, this isn't Dostoevsky's own voice, believes that human beings don't really want to be free. Uh, it's too much of a burden. And Dostoevsky's analysis here, or maybe the, you know, it's, it's easy to lose the layers. So Dostoevsky, Ivan, the Grand Inquisitor. But the analysis is that Jesus came to offer freedom, but that, according to the Inquisitor, that was a gift that humans couldn't handle. Humans don't really want that. They can't handle it when they have it. You know, give a community of people too much freedom, and then they start uh, separating into separate uh, cliques and into their own individual world and no longer share a communal life. So the second of the three temptations of Satan to Jesus is cast thyself down from the temple pinnacle. And Jesus refuses, even though the devil's able to quote scripture and says, you know, it's, it's uh, prophesied that, you know, the angels will catch you. I forget the exact reply, but that uh, whereas the devil wants Jesus to perform a miracle, namely jump from this high point and be saved and not die, Jesus refuses and again refuses to perform a miracle or in this case, uh, in my translation, a mystery and Ivan or the Inquisitor thinks that, you know, if only you'd perform that mystery, people would follow you uh, with total devotion because that's what enchants the human mind is mystery as well as miracle. And so the Inquisitor says, you know, I know what you were up to. You were trying to show us that we should follow you for who you are, uh, you know, a true son of God, or God himself mm -hmm. in a certain understanding, and that we should do so freely, not because we've been charmed by a magic show, the Inquisitor thinks that was a mistake. You tried to give us freedom, and look what happened. You know, he's alluding to the the schisms of the of the early, the first um, millennium of of Christianity. That you know, not even the Christians themselves were able to handle the freedom that Jesus uh, enjoined them to accept. The third uh, temptation is uh, Satan offers Jesus dominion over the entire world. Uh, that he could be the king of kings. And Jesus refuses, uh, again, in uh, the Inquisitor's understanding, which I, I take to be Dostoevsky's as well, because this God doesn't want us to follow him because he's powerful in, in any worldly sense, but rather that he's the true God. And again, the Inquisitor criticizes Jesus by saying, you overestimated us as a species, we can't handle freedom, uh, give us too much freedom, we lose our communities, we lose our meaning, uh, everything becomes a question for us, peace is lost, uh, human life becomes a catastrophe of nihilism, of a, a lack of meaning in our lives, a lack of consensus that we need to form a community. Uh, you gave us that freedom and you didn't realize that would be the result, how could you? Uh, we now here the Inquisitor is speaking for the Catholic Church, we finally figured it out that humans are not able to handle their freedom. Instead, uh, they live their best lives when they become docile subjects of an institution like the Catholic Church, who offers them the three things they crave the most, which is miracles, mysteries, and authority. And of course, this is the 17th century uh, Spanish Church, which did exercise an, an extreme uh, amount of authority insofar as it could um, prosecute the Inquisition. So this is Dostoevsky's critique of the Catholic Church. He thinks that it's the, the corrupt Rome, Romish version of the true Christian message, which he thought was embodied uh, in the Russian Orthodox Church. But independent of schismatic um, battles between different types of, of Christians, the, the larger message, and this is why this is included uh, in existentialism source books, is that it calls into question whether we really want freedom. So I presented the Gorgias uh, encomium of Helen as um, a quite vivid argument that we don't have freedom. Again, there are many arguments in the history of philosophy that we do and that we don't for other reasons, but I think Gorgias encomium of Helen is the, is the most direct way to raise that question and to think about its many consequences from uh, politics to psychology to law and so on. But even if we have freedom, is it something that we want? 
and this cynical voice of the Inquisitor, the Grand Inquisitor of Ivan, although I don't think of Dostoevsky himself, the cynical voice says, no, we don't want it because we can't handle it. It leads to isolation, nihilism, and war. And it's a kind of prophecy of Dostoevsky, not unlike uh, prophecies of Nietzsche, uh, who also addressed the, the problem of nihilism at this period uh, in the late 19th century. Uh, Nietzsche made a prophecy that the next 200 years, and he was writing in 1887 when he said this, the next 200 years will be the great uh, drama in world history. It will be the drama of nihilism, namely what happens when a powerful civilization that's beginning to influence all the world, as Europe was, what happens when it loses confidence in that there is a meaning in life? Uh, what happens to its people? How do they gather around um, the same meaning if they don't think there's any meaning at all? And Nietzsche thought it would be a crisis in, in the history of humanity, a, a, an unrivaled crisis that, from which humanity would, would not survive unless it were able to um, come to a new meaning. And we'll talk about Nietzsche in, in other episodes. But just consider that prophecy for the moment. Uh, spoken in 1887, about the next 200 years, well, we are entering the final phase, uh, the final quarter of that prophecy. And uh, of course, there were points in the 20th century, like ooh, 1943, for example, when uh, it would have seemed to, the answer might have seemed to be no. Uh, 1945, even, with the dropping of the atomic bomb, uh, two of them on, on Japan. Well, now, of course, we have the environmental crisis that uh, raises this in, in a way that seems to be even beyond any any one government's control, any, any individual's control, certainly. So at any rate, I think there's a similarity between Dostoevsky's prophecy about the future of, um, of modernity, that is, the future of... of societies that take on these characteristics of modern Europe. Uh, think back to what I said about Foucault in the previous episode about the era of discipline, the era of efficiency, the, what becomes the industrial era of industrial capitalism and the, the immense environmental degradation that's been uh, executed upon the planet in the meantime. If we think about what we've done uh, since Dostoevsky and Nietzsche wrote and that we've done that, if not because we wanted to be free, but at, at the very least because of the power that freedom, these new freedoms gave us. Uh, it's, it is a real question, uh, as, as it was for Dostoevsky before those things happened. Uh, do we want to be free? And uh, again, I, I don't really have anything specific to say about the Banner Snatch episode in this regard, but I think it would be a, an episode worth thinking about in that light, that the the character finds himself determined and that that is anguish to him. And then it raises the question, is that accurate? Would, would we be truly anguished to find out that we're determined? Wouldn't it relieve us of a tremendous anxiety? And the, it's the anxiety of freedom, which is the anxiety about making the choice. Because after all, if you're free, you can make the wrong choice. And uh, well, I'll speak personally, that gives me a great amount of anguish. I certainly in my life have been drawn to philosophies and institutions that even if they didn't promise to take away my freedom, I felt them as doing that, as making decisions for me. And there's a relief that comes with that. But, and again, this is why this is an existentialist text. Um, I will say personally, I think that's irresponsible. I think that you can't actually surrender your freedom. If you join an institution or subscribe to a philosophy that gives you the illusion that you don't have freedom, you still have the freedom and you're exercising it in a self-deceptive way. And that's, that's Sartre's lesson about, about freedom, is that it's, it makes us anxious and we look for ways to surrender it, but no surrender is a real surrender, it's only a self-deception of a truly free agent. 